Hey everybody, this is Ian O'Byrne. We're taking another look at the web literacy work. Uh, this is module four, specifically in module four, we're looking at writing or online content construction. If we look at online content construction, I've written about this and framed it in the past. The, the academic jargon that I've used is students encoding and decoding meaning by constructing, redesigning, and reinventing online texts. So we're going to dig into that throughout this video. As we've talked about in the past, we live in, in this tremendous intersection between literacy practices, digital text and tools, and trying to make sense of what all of this means for teaching and learning in our classroom. In the previous modules, we've talked about online reading comprehension or reading. We've talked about online collaborative inquiry or ways that we can have individuals participate and connect with each other online. In all of this work, um, one of the challenges that I had was I was thinking about my own classroom and one of the pieces that I love to teach as an English language arts teacher, and that was writing. I love writing because I had the opportunity to allow my students to create, to compose, to uh, build something new that they had previously, uh, you know, not even thought about. And it was a way to evidence learning um, through that creative side. The cool thing is that with the ubiquity of digital text and tools that are out there, we have new text, new tools, new opportunities to create, and it makes it easier and easier to play around with digital media. Uh, you know, previously we would think about making a video or making a movie and, and the challenges and how it might be very difficult to create something that looked high quality. And now we have apps that you can push a button and you almost instantaneously grab some you know video or grab an image and share it online with others you can add filters we can add a lot of your own nuance and flair to it and so all we see is that it's becoming even easier to quickly make products that look relatively high quality in addition we have to think about the the mashup culture or remix culture that we're currently in so Remix Mashup Culture basically allows us to take other content that people have put online and critique it, remix it, recreate it, you know, spin it, and add our own voice and our own perspective into what other people have shared online. There's a tremendous amount of power that occurs as we can basically create space for, for ourselves to have our voices heard um, in the mix of all the other stuff that's already out there online. One of the things that we have to think about is when we bring this into our classroom, one of the big challenges is that through all of these digital text and tools, now we have new opportunities to think about style, tone, voice, design, aesthetics, and how that impacts the message that we ultimately communicate. So a lot of times in education, we're not taught to think about visual literacies or not, you know, we don't think about graphic design or design elements in student work or student assessments, but we need to start thinking about how do we integrate this into our content and how do we integrate this into the pedagogical choices that we make in our classroom. So when we look at the web literacy map, so far we've talked about uh, exploring or navigating the web and writ broadly as reading. This is version 1.1. Um, we moved into connecting or participating online. This was an online collaborative inquiry. Now we're moving into building um, or creating or writing the web. And I framed it as online content construction in the past. So if we look at version 1.1, this is basically made up of composing for the web, remix culture that we've talked about, and we'll dig into in this module, design and accessibility of content that we share online. We start to get into coding and scripting and programming. And then also version 1.1 looked at infrastructure, basically building a network of connections to help frame your identity, but then also building content online that's linked to other pieces of online infrastructure. As we move into the most recent version of the web literacy map, we can see that writing, building, you know, online content construction is pulling in that coding and that programming. It's pulling, pulling in the design elements and the design aesthetics. So it's creating content that, you know, quote unquote, looks good. Uh, we also think about composing uh, or writing out HTML or CSS or creating code, uh, revising that and remixing content that others share online or remixing our own content. So back to that academic jargon that I talked about before, 
If we look at writing or online content construction, we're looking at constructing, recreating, or remixing online text. So you could construct your own, you could recreate someone else's, or you could remix. You could take someone else's work and chop it up into smaller pieces and recreate something of your very own by actively encoding and decoding meaning. So a lot of this is coming from communications or, or, or you know, reading uh, informational text. But encoding and decoding is basically taking a message unpacking it and putting it into a way that the the individual can uh, read it and understand it or or the the vice versa we think about a message that we want to share out and we encapsulate it in a in a medium that makes it easier for other people to pick up and understand and 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 comprehend what we're trying to to send to them um, and this is all through the use of multimodal design tools so in this we'll talk about multimodal um, multimodal is coming from multi literacies and multimedia, uh, but multimodal is looking at images, text, video, audio, um, and other forms of media that we haven't even, uh, you know, designed yet. But for the most part, we're thinking about different ways to present information. And so writing is encapsulating all of this. It's figuring out how to send out a message, figuring out the audience that it's for and building or recreating or remixing that message through these design tools to get that message across to whatever audience that you're looking for. So if we think about writing, um, you know, we're going to look at the processes involved in writing and, and what it really means to be a writer, not only a reader, but a writer of online text. In my work recently, over the last year or so, I've been uh, I've seen this continuum that I believe exists where you know we we need to move our, our learners but then also first move ourselves from primarily consumers of online information to curators of online information to finally constructors or creators of digital media um, and and I'll unpack this a little bit I have other videos online where I really dig into this um, but I'll, I'll, I'll unpack it a little bit here so if we think about consumption we've talked about this a lot in online reading comprehension we do a very good job of consuming a lot of online content. We can ask questions about how effectively, um, you know, how effectively we evaluate the information that we read online. We can talk about how well we synthesize across multiple sources. But for the most part, we do, you know, adults do, and and our children and students, you know, all learners, all individuals. The internet is the dominant text of our generation, so we already actively consume. A lot of digital media per day um, and so once again we could do a better job synthesizing we could do a better job evaluating but for the most part we all are, are you know well suited to consume a lot of digital media thanks to the ubiquity of devices that we have when we talk about curation I see that there's a second step in the continuum I like to start to move people and there's already people that are in this space but move people into be being not just consumers of online content but also curators of online content. So if we think about the amount of online information that's out there, um, you know, there is a, a fire hose, there is a, a, a flood of, of media that's out there. And sometimes it can be challenging for us to think about, okay, well, what's the important stuff? Like, what's the good stuff here that I need to pay attention to as opposed to paying attention to everything? So I see there is a, is a secondary area that we can move ourselves and our learners which is curation so curation is looking at all of the wealth of information that's out there online and finding you know and and evaluating that information from a more informed more knowledgeable perspective and sharing that information out with others and sort of identifying what's the good stuff and what's the garbage you know separate the wheat from the chaff and figure out okay what's the good stuff that we need to pay attention to so this would mean that you look at all the information online and you basically curate it out and you separate the good stuff and you, you know, pull the good, the good stuff aside and you say, this is what you need to pay attention to. And it really doesn't matter what your expertise is in. Your expertise could be in literacy, it could be in technology, it could be in STEM education, it could be in maker spaces. Your, your expertise could be in, you know, CrossFit activities. Your expertise could be in uh, fine Italian handbags, tattoos, or, um, you know, dyeing and, and, you know, grooming cats. Uh, it really doesn't matter what your expertise is in, but it's basically, you know, 
looking at the information, evaluating it, and sort of making it easy for people uh, to follow and learn from your expertise. The good news is there's a lot of people that already do this. So for those of you that are out there that use Pinterest, I believe that you're already actively curating the web. Um, some people, yes, are curating, you know, we're pinning and, you know, putting boards together for a wedding or for a room we want to make over or we design ideas. But there's an opportunity to look at all the stuff online and sort of actively save and curate the good stuff that's out there from your informed perspective. So if you're using Pinterest or a tool like Pinterest, you're actively doing that already. You're sort of separating it out and being an online content curator and saying, here's the good stuff you need to pay attention to. I think there is a, a space for this in our classroom and a space for this habit in our classroom. Um, and so if we move on a little bit further, I see that there is the, the, the other end of the spectrum, and that's becoming a, a creator, becoming a digital media creator um, or a content constructor. And in this, what I see is there's an opportunity to start to really get to that online content construction or the writing that we're talking about. So this could be coding, programming. This could be uh, developing an app or creating a game. This could be uh, building a website. But then also I see there's a space for digital media creation or online content construction that doesn't really have to do with the purely digital. You know, it doesn't have to deal with purely uh, pixels. We can start to look at other media. I think that there's a space for, um, you know, we, we see maker spaces blowing up. We see STEM education, which has children, which has learners sort of hacking through. Uh, physics and design principles in the classroom. So I think there's a broad uh, array of opportunities for us to think about how can we have our learners create and build and make things. So all of the the, the elements of that, you know, makes us think that that all of those things that are conjured up by us for us when we think about making and building and creating, I see that there's an opportunity to link that into the digital content that we want our learners to not only read and participate within, but also start to build that uh, for others to check out. So if we take a look at online content construction, um, when I started thinking about this, uh, as I was doing my research, I came across this line and this really, this crystallizes for me what online content construction is all about. So if we look at it, it says digitally literate people are quick on their feet in moving from one kind of medium to another, know what kinds of expression fit what kinds of knowledge, and become skilled at presenting their information in the medium that their audience will find easiest to understand. So if you think about what that's really you know, indicating, is that we want our, our learners, we want ourselves, but we also want our learners to leave our classrooms and be digitally literate or web literate. We want them to be literate in all senses of the word. And Given that the internet is the dominant text of our generation, I think that being digitally literate is terribly important. So if we look at becoming digitally literate, what that means is we want learners that are agile and they can move from one medium to another. So they can create a tweet, they can create video, they can build a web page, they can write a five paragraph essay, they can build a map, they can build an infographic, they can stand up and give a speech in class. Um, so they have to be able to quickly move from one medium to another. They also need to know which medium, what, which selection of medium best fits the knowledge that they want to share, and then also the, the medium that their audience is going to pay attention to. So now you have someone that can, you know, adapt easily to different medium, but then at the same time think about, okay, what is the purpose of this work? Who is my audience? And then what area would they pay most attention to so if we have students in a classroom and they're responding to a school dress code um, you know they might say okay well we want to write a letter to or we want to communicate this information or our feelings to the school superintendent or the school board okay well they may listen to a different channel than the local news or to parents or to their peers so if they wanted to send a message to peers in their school Maybe they choose, you know, the, the morning announcements or they put it on this, the morning TV. But then if they wanted to send it to the news, they could possibly put together a blog post and tweet it out to the news. Whereas if they wanted to 
communicate with the school board or the school superintendent, maybe you know a blog post and a Twitter uh, a, a tweet is not the best way to reach them. Um, so it's thinking about the message, thinking about the medium, and thinking about the best way to use those and, and the intersection between those to reach the audience and get the achieve the goals that you're looking for. So I see there being five steps involved in online content construction. These are adapted from uh, the writing process, and I and I view them as planning, generating, organizing, composing, and revising. The first step in this is is planning. So whenever I have learners play with digital media I think it's important to get the digital part out of the way um, and what I mean by that is don't let them touch it it's basically getting out pens and papers and colored pencils and crayons and developing mind maps or schematics or storyboards for what you want to create because I think that when we start to think about what we want to create in terms of digital media we have internal representations of what we want to create and then we need to create external representations of that and what I mean by that is the internal representation is sort of like that idea in our head of what we want to create so if you're building a website or you are creating a video or you're drawing a picture you sort of have in your head what you want to create and in your mind you can see okay what you really want to build the challenge is uh, sometimes we forget or those those ideas change over time so what I do is I have individuals sit down and sort of map out on paper create an external representation of what they want to build on paper so that when they go to the digital side they have that map to use um, and I think it's very important to create those storyboards get those ideas on paper before we move over uh, to the, the to the digital tools there's a lot of reasons for this one is you might forget two is then as the teacher as the guide if you have students collaborating they can look at the the representations on paper those external representations and agree or disagree or or push back um, on what they have on paper what the roadmap details uh, but then also it might be a classroom management technique it might be a way to make sure that your learners know what they want to build before they go to the computer so I have Students, I create. I have students create those internal and external representations of what they want to build, and make sure it's really appropriate for that task for what they want to build. The next step is I have them generate. Generating is is looking at those external representations, those paper copies, those storyboards, and start to create or translate initial digital product. So this might be getting video cameras and going out and recording different pieces of video and or images they're going to add into the movie later um, if it's building a website you might start to build some pages of the website you might start to uh, collect images and examples of colors and themes and ideas from the internet that you want to add into your website but the generation side is sort of just building up content it's building up product that's you're ready to use um, and this is in a way akin to brainstorming but it's really building that digital product so the idea is that not everything will be used here but you want to start creating content so that you know what this will look like or you begin to see what this will look like so this is the creation side this is translating that external representation into digital product and it's it's slowly starting to build that up from generation we move to organization so that's taking the the initial content that you build up and starting to move it around and see what fits where so in our mind we might have an idea of how this video is going to lay out we have uh, where the content will line up in the video or if we're building a website we might have an idea or a map of where things will line up but then as you start to build digital content as you generate it you're gonna put things next to each other and sometimes they don't fit and that's okay and this is the point of the process where you start to move things around and say well maybe this part of the video belongs after these other segments or this part of the website or this part of the game or this part of the app should really be in a different place because it doesn't look quite right here so it's restructuring and moving around the hierarchy or manipulating the hierarchy of the work so that it makes a little bit more sense for your task at hand after this, I have students move into real composition. 
that's when you're looking at a more polished final product. Um, and what we're doing is we're weaving elements in together to think about cohesion across all of the different elements. So this is when you look at that video and you put the polish on the video and you're adding transitions to really make it smoothly move across the video. You're adding audio or, you know, or, or uh, narration to it. If you're building a website, this is when you're, you know, double checking um, the, the headings and the subheads on your website to make sure everything fits and links work. But you're really looking for a cohesive final composition or final product, making sure that it meets all of your goals. So this is nearing the end of the whole piece so that you're getting for a beta launch of this whole product. After this, I have students move into a revision piece where they either peer edit or peer review and revise with a, a, with a colleague or a friend in the classroom, a critical friend, or it, it, with adults, I, I identify a need to find critical friends in the process and figure out what works for them and how we can best improve the product by reviewing and examining and improving the overall work product to make sure that this really meets your goals. So there's a lot of tools that I use in my classroom to make this happen. Um, for one, I think that you need a, a website um, you know, just a, a main hub to have everything live so that you can look back over time and see growth. Um, with that, I have on the second line, WordPress, Weebly, Wix, and Blogger. I think it's important to have a blog, a, a place that you can openly reflect about your decisions over time. Um, so this is sort of documenting thinking over time as a way to, uh, if you get stuck, to be able to like press pause and go back a little bit and see what decisions did I make in the past and what did I do in those decisions um, that either worked or didn't work. There's other tools down there that I use. I use SoundCloud a lot or uh, audio or voice podcasts. So I think that there's an opportunity to record audio as a way to share information. Uh, so I do, I have an audio podcast that I share out online. It's interviews with people in education, technology and literacy. But then also, I think there's a way to share audio comments or audio feedback on student work. Uh, and then the last piece there is Jing or Screencast-O-Matic. But really, that falls into the idea of screen captures and screencasts. Uh, many years ago, when I first started doing this, I looked at screen captures and screencasts. And I thought that this would be something that it would be nice if all teachers were able to do this. Now, I think we're, we're very, we're, we're beyond that. Now, we're at a place where all educators pre-k up through higher ed you need to have uh, you need to be an expert in the development of screen captures that's images taken from your screen that you can mark up and annotate and also screen casts so exactly what I'm doing here which is sitting in front of a microphone sitting in front of my, of my computer and using these tools to teach so creating materials from images and or video screen capture screencast to explain document your thinking so i think that all all educators pre-k up through higher ed need to have expertise in doing this um, this is basically scaffolding learners providing multiple opportunities for your learners to go back and think through or learn from you um, so especially in education this is something that we really need to to have expertise in so why is this stuff important? First of all, I think online content construction or writing is an excellent way to support online and traditional literacy practices. So I think that in, you know, we have this belief that we want our students to be able to, to read a, a textbook and then write to express what they've learned. Well, now there's a way to open that up and we can say, okay, instead of just writing an essay or a five paragraph essay, you can put together a wiki or you can share information on your blog or you could share a video. Uh, you can have a screencast or you can have, you know, a, a, a narration where you record your thoughts about this and sort of create a log of learning over time. I think this is also important because this brings in a lot of, it has the opportunity to bring in a lot of the out of school learning that is important to our students that we might be able to bring into the classroom and draw learners into what we want to have them do. So there is an opportunity to say to our learners, okay, well, I understand that you enjoy and you use YouTube videos. Well, what if we had the opportunity to, to create those sort of videos in our classroom? You know, it, and, and you know, you've researched 50 states. What if instead of you creating 
a, you know, a, a, a diorama or a poster about your state, you could create a video all about that. Um, or saying, okay, you know, I, I know that you like playing games or you believe, you know, you use apps. We have the opportunity to create games or create videos or apps in our classroom to document learning over time. I think there's a way to get our students excited about the content that we have to teach if we can figure out how do we tie in and how do we have them create this sort of content that they'll need to be able to master in their future. I also think this is really important because we see a lot of information that's shared both positive and or negative in the you know on the internet and a lot of times you know our learners or we disagree with that information and in, in order for the the internet to be the dominant text I think that means that all individuals have to have the opportunity to not only read but write in that informational space. So in effect what we're doing is if we're teaching our learners, our children, how to create digital media, if we're teaching them how to send out tweets and develop websites and create videos or create apps or create games, what we're really doing is we're giving them an opportunity to make their voice heard online. That's terribly important, okay? I think that our, our learners need to be able to leave school with those capacities or else we're not really getting them ready for the future. So once again, if we're looking at the web literacy map, we've talked about participation in reading. Now we're moving our way into writing. If we've talked about how we can serve our learners and get them to build or, or think about online content construction. Uh, this is the last uh, the third out of the three cornerstones that really support the web literacy initiative um, this is writing and online content construction as we continue on uh, beyond these modules we'll look at digital identity and what all this work means for us but at this point thank you for watching thank you for following along please leave any questions that you might in the comment section of this video